Well, good morning and welcome to Church Online here at Faith Community Church. I'm just pleased that you made it a priority to be in church this morning. I'm honored that you chose to join us here at Faith Community. Uh, if you don't know us, if you're new or visiting, this is your first time joining us online. My name's Russell. I'm the pastor here. And I just want to say, if you want more information about who we are, you'd like to connect, you'd like to find out uh, what we believe, you can find all of that on our website. You can go to www.woodstockfcc.com. That's woodstockfcc, that's faithcommunitychurch.com. You'll find just about anything you could want to know about us on there. The website's kept up to date uh, almost daily. There's some updates going on. You can find past sermons. You can find the links for the YouTube or the audio connected to your Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening to your podcast, you can find us. And just about anything you might want to know about us is there. And if there's something more you want to know, you can find a way to contact us and reach out to us. If you want to share a prayer request or just get to know us a little better, please do reach out to us. So that's woodstockfcc.com. Now this morning, we are starting, or I should say continuing, but last week was just a bit of an introduction in a new sermon series that we're calling the Habits of Happiness. So last week we introduced this concept, and this week we're going to begin to finally dig in a little and flesh out what the Bible teaches about happiness. Because what the Bible teaches is actually quite countercultural. The culture around us says happiness happens when you get... But Jesus teaches, as we looked at last week, happiness happens when you give it. He says, you'll find abundant joy when you obey him. And what did he tell us to do in the same uh, passage? He said, here's my command to you, love one another the same way that I love you. So what we are exploring then are the one another statements found in scripture. We're looking at what the Bible teaches us, how we should treat and interact with each other, those around us. Because ultimately, that's what's going to lead to a happy life. And there's a wonderful side effect uh, as we work on these, what we're calling habits, as they become character formation in our own life, as we continually seek to do good to others. Not only do we become happy, but we make other people happy too. And so the little catchphrase of this series is, doing good does good for the good doer. So we're going to take the next few weeks, probably about 10 or so, and we're going to look at these one another statements, and we're going to learn to build these up as habits. We're going to put them into practice. I can't force that on you, but that's the only way that this, uh, what I'm teaching is going to work, is if you actually do these things, if they become more than ideas in your head. But as you build them up into habits, and ultimately as they become part of your character, not only are you going to be happier, but you're going to make just so many more people around you happy too. So this morning we're going to jump into our very first one another statement, and we're going to start by looking at 1 Thessalonians 5.11. This is what it says. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. I'm going to start with quite a bold statement here, but I, I think it's uh, true the importance of encouragement cannot be overstated. I mean, if you talked up about encouragement, if you said it was one of the greatest things in your life that you could do, I think you would be telling the truth. In fact, we have uh, many uh, examples of encouragement on display for us, not only here on earth, we could point to a lot of great people, but up in heaven. <laughs> Let me read a few verses for us that, I won't actually read the verse, but I'll tell you what they say. I'll give you the reference. You can look it up later. So let's start. Romans 15, 5. If you go and read that, what it actually says is God is an encourager. God gives encouragement. If you read 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 verse, and 17, it says that Jesus is an encourager. Jesus gives encouragement. If you went back to Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it says one of the main purposes of the Bible, the reason we have scriptures, one of the main reasons is so that God can use it to encourage us. The Bible encourages us. Hebrews 12, 1 talks about how we have this, they call it a great cloud of witnesses, meaning we have people who have gone on before, some call us the saints, and we have them up in heaven cheering us on, encouraging us. 
You know, ultimately, when Jesus begins to talk about and teach about the Holy Spirit, you can find that in John chapter 14 to 16, he calls the Holy Spirit an encourager. In fact, the term he uses is significant. Jesus uses this word parakletos to describe the Holy Spirit. You probably see that translated if you went to read those chapters as advocate or helper. Those are great translations. That's really what a big part of being an encourager is. But the root of that word, parakletos, it finds its root in another Greek word, which is parakaleo, which means encouragement. Parakaleo, you see, is this compound word, and we get two parts of it then. Para, the preface, it means by the side, and then you get kaleo, which means to call or to call out. So we can understand then what is an encourager. It is someone who comes alongside someone else and calls out something from within them. And as we just talked about, God does this, Jesus does this, the Holy Spirit does this, the Bible does this, and even saints who have gone on before us do this. So it seems, at least to me, from a scriptural or a heavenly point of view, that encouragement is of the utmost importance. The importance of encouragement cannot be overstated. So I think it should be pretty clear, in case it wasn't, scripture makes it abundantly clear that we should be doing this. We are to encourage one another. We should come alongside someone else and call out something good from within them. And Jesus, he not only taught this, but he modeled it. There's a few places we could point to, but I want to draw your attention to one particular example. When I think about the disciples, if, if there was ever one of them that needed encouragement, I think it was probably Simon Peter. I mean, we don't know everything about the lives of the disciples, but the picture we get from Scripture is that Simon Peter was rash, brash. He was quick to speak. He was slow to understand. It's, it's almost as if he likely had trouble walking because he spent so much time with his foot in his mouth. But there is something that Jesus saw in him. There's something in Simon Peter that Jesus saw that he probably didn't even see himself until, and that's the important part, until Jesus came alongside him and called it out. So I want to read Matthew 16. I'm going to start at verse 13. So Matthew 16, I'm going to start at verse 13. It says this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciple, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of his prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. When asked a question... It doesn't take much courage or intellect or, or bravery to offer someone else's opinion. It's pretty easy to offer someone else's opinion because if they're right, you now, as the person who offered that opinion, get to join them in being right. And if they're wrong, well, you can kind of step aside, push it aside a little and say, I was only giving their opinion. I didn't say I believed it myself. The fault lies with them alone. Really, I had nothing to do with it. So when Jesus asked, who, who do people say I am? The disciples jump at the opportunity to share some theories they've heard, maybe even some theories they themselves believed. But Jesus moves then, and he makes it personal, and he, he's essentially saying to them, okay, I've heard what others are saying. Now it's time for you. Put your cards on the table. No more hiding. Who do you say I am? Anyone who's ever spent considerable time in a classroom knows the exact right way to respond to this situation. When the teacher asks a question and you don't know the answer or you're afraid of the answer 
or you have a guess, but you're pretty sure you're wrong, here's what you do. You look away. You look anywhere but at the teacher. You do everything and anything in your power to draw attention away from you. You don't want to give the teacher a single reason to look at you. I did that a lot in my Greek classes. I loved taking Greek, but it was challenging. And I did attempt to participate in class. If I knew the answer, I would gladly you know, put my hand up and volunteer, but seemingly I didn't get picked very often. And my professor had a way of knowing when I didn't know an answer. Maybe my poker face isn't as good as I think it is, but seemingly every single time he asked a question and I did that, looked away, don't, don't pick me, don't pick me, don't pick me, don't pick me. Seemingly every time that was the case, he would call on me and I would have to offer up a, a random theory, a guess. I was wrong quite often. Peter, though, we know wasn't like this. He wasn't normal. Simon Peter, he, he wasn't afraid of speaking, even if he wasn't sure of his answer. And so when Jesus does ask, and he says, let's get personal, put your cards on the table, tell me, who do you say I am? Many of the disciples probably did the very thing we just talked about, looked away, averted their gaze, said, don't, don't ask me, Jesus, please don't, don't ask me. But Peter, with probably some of the most profound and scandalous words ever spoken, responded. He said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That word, Christ, Messiah, it's a special word. It's not a word that was used often or thrown around. It means the anointed one or the chosen one. It is an audacious and bold claim that Simon here is making. And Simon Peter's probably one of the only people on earth who is brave enough or brash enough anyways to make such a claim. Jesus, you are the one. Jesus responds, we're now in verse 17. He responds by saying, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. See, Jesus, he's, he's ecstatic with the response. He said, blessed are you. He's, he's using that word, it's makarios, that we translate here as blessed, but what it means is happy. He, he's saying, Simon Peter, be happy, be encouraged. You answered so well, if we wanted to bring this up into modern day language in very colloquial terms, Jesus would have gone to Peter and patted him on the back and said, way to go, Peter. You nailed it. In fact, Jesus is so happy with his response that he takes Simon's name and he changes it. And if you don't know, name changes are very significant things in the Bible. And so this is what Jesus says to him. He says, you are no longer Simon, but you are now Peter. You are Petros. This is this term that is extremely similar to rock in Greek. And, and Jesus, he's using this new name as a means of calling out something from within Simon Peter. He says, you know, are no longer Simon. You are Peter. Today, you expressed rock solid faith. And I want you to remember that. Because there are going to be times, and specifically we can think of one time, where your faith is going to be tested. And I want you to be reminded by this new name of this moment. I want you to be reminded, you are no longer Simon. You are Peter. You are Petros. You are a rock. Imagine how he felt in that moment. Imagine how Peter felt. I, I bet he felt pretty good. I bet he felt quite encouraged. I, I think it would feel wonderful to hear Jesus say those wonderful things about me. So I imagine Peter felt wonderful. Jesus, he saw something within him and he called it out. More than this, if you kept reading in that passage, Jesus, he, he not only said, not only is your name being changed because you expressed rock solid faith, but I want you to know, he says, on this rock, again, playing on that word, on this Petros, the church will be built. Be encouraged, Peter. What a legacy to be placed on you. What an encouragement. This is what 
encouragers do. No, I don't mean they go and change people's names, although, I mean, if you know someone quite well, a well-placed nickname can be a great method of encouragement. But what I mean is this, encouragers summon the best out of others. Encouragers build others up. Have you ever stopped long enough to think about the incredible gifts that artists have? I'm not an artist, I can't draw. Uh, I'm a musician though, and so when I think of, uh, of the amazing uh, mastery and, and genius of, specifically, I'm always wowed by when I think of composers, I think of these people who, in their head, can hear such depth of music. Not only can they hear the whole, but they can hear the individual parts, and they have the ability and the knowledge to go and to write it down. I might be able to pluck out a little melody here or there, but to hear a symphony in my head, to be able to go and write down the part for first violin, second violin, the tuba, the piccolo, whatever, that has always wowed me. They have the ability to see something or hear something before it comes to be. This week I was, as I was preparing the sermon, thinking about sculptors in particular. I have a harder time appreciating uh, visual art because I'm not a visual artist, but there is a level of appreciation there still. I was thinking about sculptors and how they're essentially the epitome of what encouragers are to be. Think of like the statue of David, probably one of the most famous uh, sculptures ever. This is, I think Michelangelo did it. And I don't know, just imagine it starting. A big slab of marble gets wheeled out before him. He looks at it and within a solid slab of marble, he can see the statue of David. And what does he do? He chips away everything that's not the statue of David. He brings out David from within the marble. That's what encouragers are doing. You know, when you hear sculptors talk, you'll often hear them say, like, the, the sculpture, the statue was always within there. I just had to remove everything that wasn't part of it. You see, it's the whole concept that they could see something greater within the block, and all they had to do was call it out. And this is what we are to do as encouragers. As I said earlier, we all need to be encouragers, and I cannot overstate the importance of encouragement. Here's what some studies show on encouragement. A happy and healthy marriage has a positive to negative ratio of five to one. That's what the current studies are showing. That means for every negative comment or criticism, there needs to be five words of encouragement. Studies on businesses and on work teams found extremely similar results. If you want happy workers, which by the way you do, if you're a leader of any kind, you want the people you are leading to be happy because then they will trust you more, they will take your words more seriously, and ultimately they'll be more productive. So the studies done on work teams and businesses found the very similar results. It's a five to one ratio. So for every criticism you have to give someone you're leading, you need to first give them five positive remarks, five levels of encouragement. Consequently, when they studied teams that were lower performing and failing businesses, they actually found the ratio almost to be reversed. Low performing teams generally had a three to one negative to positive ratio. Three negative comments for every one positive. More than this, a psychological study found that having positive emotions actually opens your mind up. It makes you more aware of the world around you. There's a buzzword that's been going around for a few years. They call it mindfulness. It's this ability to see things and be mindful of those and the uh, objects around you. So the studies are now beginning to show that having positive comments and a positive emotion into your life actually 
makes you more open to the world around you. And the inverse is true as well. Having negative emotions and having negative comments given to you actually makes your mind constrict. It closes the world around you. This study translates, I think, into the real world very quick. Uh, just maybe one example to bring it out. I know you're missing sports, so I'm going to go with a hockey metaphor this morning. If after quite a bad period, the coach, if he wants his team to go back onto the ice and perform well to have better vision on the ice, better what they call game sense, then here's what he shouldn't do. He shouldn't get angry. He shouldn't yell. He shouldn't only point out their mistakes. None of that will help. If he wants the team to return to the ice with better vision and better gameplay, he needs to offer affirmation and encouragement. That's what the studies are showing. This is not about not offering criticism. There is a time and a place for criticism. Absolutely. And in fact, one of our one another statements that we'll get to in the coming weeks is actually to admonish one another. We need criticism. We need correction. So this is not about not ever criticizing, but it's about understanding and keeping the positive to negative ratios in balance. If you want to bring the best out of someone, yes, sometimes that means there needs to be criticism, but you are not going to bring the best out of someone if you're only beating them down. Encouragers build others up. There will be a point and a time to point out errors. There's no correction if you don't do that. So it's very important to do that. But if all you're doing is pointing out errors, if all you're doing is offer negative, negative comments, if all you're doing is offer criticism, all you're going to end up doing is lowering that person's self-confidence, self-esteem, self-image, and ultimately making them less happy, which we know makes them less productive. And the truth is they'll be less likely to listen to you in the future. But if you can learn the power of the positive to negative ratios, if you can keep it five to one, that person who you do need to offer criticism to, they are going to be eager to make the corrections that you're giving them. Why? Because they now believe that they can do better. They now believe that they can be better. Why? Because you have come alongside them and you have already called out five great things from within them. Anyone who's ever been encouraged knows the importance and the power of encouragement. If you've ever received praise from someone you look up to, from someone you respect, from someone who is in a position of trust over you, from someone who is over you, a leader, then you know how good it feels to be encouraged. Because even if what they're saying is something you don't believe yourself, if you trust them, you will trust what they are saying and when you get some good praise and encouragement, often it'll make you blush. I read this wonderful story this week of a little boy who, uh, they're at home, he went up to his, his dad and he said, Dad, let's play darts. I'll throw them and you just stand there and say, wonderful. We all need someone to come alongside us and say, wonderful. We all need encouragement. One of the great things that the Bible teaches us is God does that for us. God is like a good father who stands there and says, wonderful. Two verses jump to my mind when I think of this immediately. Psalm 139. God says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The second comes from Ephesians 2, I think verse 10 and it says, God says he created you and you are his masterpiece. You think the statue of David is good? God says not compared to you. See, God often comes alongside us just to say wonderful. But he also comes alongside us with corrections too. More than this, something that Jesus and God do is often they'll enlist others to join them on this crusade of happiness, on this revolution of joy. And they'll enlist others to be joy spreaders, happiness spreaders. They'll enlist others to come alongside you and say, wonderful. 
And more importantly, they're enlisting you to join them as a happiness spreader. So you can go alongside others and say it too. Because the truth is we live in quite a discouraging world. I, I Again, I don't mean with everything going on now, though certainly I guess that's part of it. What I mean is if you've ever thought about what the message the world is saying to you, it's quite discouraging. Essentially, what the world says, what particularly marketing agencies tell you, is that there is something wrong with you. Companies spend um, so much money, more money than we could count, telling you that you are inadequate or deficient in some way. Oh, you need this cream because, well, got those wrinkles. You need new clothes because, well, this shirt, out of style. You need a new gadget because your old gadget can't do what this new one can. Listen, if you watch TV, if you read magazines, if you look through social media or anywhere on the internet for that matter, if you drive in your car and you pass a billboard, they are all working on convincing you of one thing. You are inadequate. You are chubby. You are too tall. You are smelly. You are ugly. You are out of date. Whatever it is, you are constantly being told that you are inadequate or deficient in some way. So it is so important that you have a group of truth tellers to combat the lies that you face on a daily basis. Who will do it for you? You know, this is uh, not something we talk about a lot, but it's totally fine to go to someone and say, can you be an encourager in my life? What would happen if you ask just three people you respect and trust, say, can you be an encourager in my life? Can once in a while you just send me a message or give me a call and tell me uh, some truth into my life? I need you to speak some truth. I need you to call out something great from within me. I bet you they would do it. But just as importantly, I want to ask you this morning, who will you do it to? Who will you be an encourager to? Are you willing to be a happiness spreader? Are you willing to be part of what we're calling this underground revolution of happiness by giving it away? If yes, then let me quickly walk through two very practical ways for you to give encouragement away. And I specifically want you to do it this week. I'm challenging you. I'll give a homework assignment at the end to do this this week. Here's the first one. Number one, listen to someone intently. This is a lot harder than it sounds. It's a lot harder than most of us realize. We all typically like to think we are good listeners. But so often when we say we are good listeners is we mean we will briefly hear you, but then we are going to be inside of our own head. We are, uh, at worst case, thinking about something completely off topic, maybe a little better case. We are thinking ahead, trying to get ahead in the conversation. Maybe we're already planning our response to what you're saying. So we're not actively listening because we're inside our own head. Maybe we interrupt you as you speak. Maybe we are refuting something you're saying or we're beginning to rationalize our opinion. And the truth is, if you do any of those things, you are not actually listening. So part of your homework then for this week is to become an active listener. Listen to someone intently. Put your phone down unless you're talking on the phone. Turn the TV off. Remove distractions, don't interrupt, don't correct. Give one of the rarest gifts you can give, your full attention. I read a quote a number of years ago, but it's stuck with me all this time. It's probably been more than 10 years ago since I read it and it has still stuck with me. This is what it said. Being listened to and being loved are so closely related that often the person can't tell the difference. Being listened to and being loved are so closely related that often the person can't tell the difference. Put this into practice this week. Call someone, 
video call them if you have that ability, and then say this and watch their face light up. Tell me the whole story and don't spare a single detail. And then listen. This is an amazing act of encouragement that you can do for others. Number two, so first listen intently to someone here's number two, praise someone abundantly. One of the definitions of biblical encouragement I came across this week, it said this, biblical encouragement is no casual kind word, but rather a premeditated resolve to lift the spirit of another person. Hebrews 10, 24 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. That word there, consider, is significant. It means this, to perceive clearly. So this verse in Hebrews is saying, Let us fully understand. Let us perceive with clarity. Let us closely consider how we can encourage one another. Why? So that we can help each other become more like Christ, so that we can call something greater from within someone. There's something that happens inside a person when someone comes alongside them and with forethought and with love and with care, calls something greater from within them. Max Lucado, in his book, How Happiness Happens, he, he recounts a story about a young father whose daughter was going through something I'm not looking forward to here, but his daughter was going through the terrible twos. So the father decided he would take his daughter out for breakfast and he would just share with her how important she was, how much uh, him and his wife loved her. And so they went out for breakfast, this special daddy-daughter date, and he said something like this to her. He said, Jenny, I want you to know how special you are to mommy and me. We prayed for you for years, and now that you're here and growing up to be such a wonderful girl, we couldn't be more proud of you. When he had finished, his daughter looked up to him and said, Longer, Daddy. Longer. So he continued to affirm and encourage her, and after he'd finished, she again responded, Longer. This happened a few more times. Later, reflecting on the breakfast, the father said this, I never did get much to eat that morning, but my daughter received the emotional nourishment that she needed very much. We all need encouragement, and part of encouragement is praise. We all know or can picture someone that can use this type of encouragement. So this is your second part of your homework this week. Call someone, contact someone, and say to them, you ready? Can I have two minutes of uninterrupted time to tell you what an amazing person you are? And then let loose, do it. Spend the next two minutes building them up. Affirm them, embarrass them with the amount of praise you are giving. Drench them in words of encouragement so that they receive the emotional nourishment that they so need. We're going to close this morning, and I want to close with a, a video. This is actually a commercial that Ikea ran back in 2008. I'm, let's watch it together, and then I'll discuss it a little as we close. So here is our commercial from Ikea. Blossom makes me happy. You're making a difference in the world. You are beautiful. 
I brought them here to see the plan, I was like, a plant is getting bullied. Like, it's not normal. I think it's an excellent project. To have something tangible that they can actually physically be a part of is, I think, going to be very powerful. As the weeks passed, I started noticing that the one that was being bullied uh, started kind of to droop. While the plant that was being complimented, it was, it was flourishing and beautiful. It's raised the profile massively of different forms of bullying and the effects that bullying can have on people. If it affects a plant, it can definitely affect other people. This was a famous study that IKEA replicated here. It's not pretend, let me be clear. This is something that's been done over and over again. It is not TV magic that you're watching. This is reality. The plants are in enclosed environments. They receive the same amount of water, the same amount of sunlight, the same soil. Everything about them is identical except one thing. The words that are being spoken to them. So let me ask you this morning, if speaking kindly to a plant can cause it to flourish, and if speaking negatively to a plant can cause it to wither, how are your words affecting other people? Are you helping them flourish, or are you causing them to wither? This is the first habit of happiness that I'm asking you to work on. I'm going to be working on it with you here. We want to encourage one another. and We want to do it with intention until it becomes part of who we are, until we become like Christ, until we become encouragers. So this week I'm giving you two homework assignments. And I'm going to check in next week to make sure you did them. And they are, number one, listen intensely to someone. And number two, praise someone abundantly. Do what good encouragers do. Come alongside someone and call out the Peter from within the Simon. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says, Look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. Would you give the gift to others? that God loves to give to you, encouragement. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you are the great encourager, that you come alongside us and say, wonderful. That you listen intently to us, that you praise us in abundance. You are so proud of us. You tell us that we are masterpieces. Our prayer, Lord, is that we can become a little more like Christ this week, that we can share happiness as he has shared joy and happiness with us, and that we can do that through our encouragement, that we can look at others, we can come alongside them and call out something great from within them, reveal it to them, something they might not even know about themselves. Would you give us wisdom and strength and courage to go and encourage those who you would have us? I believe, Lord, you have specific people for each of us to encourage this week. So I pray that each one of us would take the time to get on our knees and to listen intently to you so that you can speak into our lives and share with us those who you have a word for and that we may be a part of sharing that joy and that happiness with them. We give you thanks and praise, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, something we do here at our church is called 
take two. We do this at the end of every service, and this is just our way of ref not only reflecting, but responding to what God has been teaching us. So we take two minutes to answer two questions. The first question is, what is one thing that God is saying to you? The second question is, how is he asking you to respond? So I'm going to put the timer up, and once it's done, I'll close our service this morning. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, the chat here is going to remain open for about the next 30 or so minutes. I'll be there if you want to uh, discuss something from the sermon or share some thoughts. It would be great if you felt comfortable. You could share your take two, what God's saying to you, and what you're going to do about it this week. Uh, otherwise, just if you want to chat in general, we'll be there for about the next 30 minutes, and then the chat will close. But I just want to say again, thank you for coming. And also a reminder, if you would like to... Uh, give to our church. Again, this is something we do as regular attenders, but if you feel so inclined, all you got to do is click either the give button up at the top of the chat pane, or I'll insert a button right into chat, and it will take you to our website and explain how you can do online giving. Let me close with a benediction this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you. May he give you encouragement and peace. Thank you for coming.